Hello there, I'm Derek Fournier and welcome to Plain Spoken, the podcast where we get real about business, leadership, and life. I've spent years in the trenches of leadership and team building, and now I'm bringing those conversations out into the open. We're going to talk strategy, dissect success, and maybe share a few laughs along the way. Each episode, I'll be joined by fascinating guests, from successful CEOs to brilliant minds shaking up their industries. We're here to offer you insights, challenge your perspectives, and ignite your curiosity. So whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, there's something here for you. Join me on this journey of exploration as we make sense of the complex world of business, one conversation at a time. Let's dive into today's episode of Plain Spoken. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Plain Spoken. I am your host, Derek Fournier, and I'm actually uh, incredibly excited to talk about this topic. And this is the second in my accountability series to try and get back on a regular cadence for publishing the podcast. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the podcast uh, at the last episode. I've now really confused indexing because I do keep episode numbers, but when I do plain and simple, I don't give them an episode. And this is a six week series of topics that I've sort of laid out to get myself on this accountability run. And so now the titles end up looking like week one, episode seven, which I don't know, maybe some people like it. I, maybe, maybe don't, but I I love the topics and I certainly have enjoyed the feedback I've gotten from folks so far. So thank you so much for those of you who have listened. And especially for those of you who've shared the content with other people, that's a great way for this content to spread and for me to find out from other folks, the, the content that they want to hear more about. There are things that I care a lot about. That's usually the stuff that I'm going to focus on. There are things that I feel we at Plainsight Strategy Group are uniquely able to assist people with. And those are things that we will focus on as well. But I have also been known to go on diatribes like I did in the blog that supports this podcast. And you guys may have noticed the pattern now. I have a blog that goes out on Wednesday, and then we have the podcast that goes deeper into that topic. Uh, and I riffed a little bit on a Patrick Nagel uh, fascination I had as a younger man. And hopefully someone out there got that joke, and I'm not the only old guy who remembered Patrick Nagel. But today's topic is company culture. And this is one of those topics that can uh, inspire all kinds of reactions. And I'm sure that the topics we'll cover under culture will do that very thing. Uh, but but I kind of poke fun at something that's going on in LinkedIn. In general, LinkedIn is one of the few social media platforms that I'm leveraging currently uh, because it does feel like the workiest uh, social media platform. But there is the typical spread of things that do seem to be functional, effective, uh, but that I, I don't know, I hate, which are these sort of one screen images with a trite aphorism and then a LinkedIn profile. And then you have to go find out why that person said it. Like culture is more than foosball tables and free drinks, right? That That's something that people really want you to know right now. In case, in case you're sitting there and thought that is in fact what company culture was, be clear, according to all of the experts in the LinkedIn universe, that is not it. Now, I never thought that there was an outbreak of belief that that was company culture. I thought those were just things that companies did. When I worked at Microsoft, we had all sorts of cool stuff. We had free drinks, we had pool tables, we got massages, but we didn't think that was the company culture. And in fact, I don't really know anyone who really is a manager, leader, director, whatever, who thought that was company culture that wasn't in a sitcom. And I do think that that's a trend that we're in right now where people are taking these concepts that are are just ridiculous and pretending that they're real situations. You know, a, a company culture is about values, shared values, the things that a company as a group of human animals finds important and ideally that helps drive the way they make decisions. Uh, it is important. Uh, some people think of culture as a squishy, soft, touchy-feely thing. And, and as I've mentioned to you in previous podcasts, I'm currently in uh, my late Simon Sinek uh, rabbit hole, and I'm in the infinite game. And this is a lot of discussion about when leaders make decisions based on short-term results, how that can be really destructive to businesses, which, as Simon uh, goes on to say, you know, business is an infinite game. It's not a game like a football game that has a defined end point. And so when I look at the most important things that a company can do right, it's it's really always going to go back to culture. And, and one of the reasons it does that is because there are a couple of underpinnings of culture that are immutable, 
uh, and uh, unwavering. And and I have babbled about them in almost every writing that I've done and every podcast that I've recorded and every meeting I've attended. Uh, they are trust and authenticity. So with with that said, uh, we've got to get into this topic and talk about the things that, that tie into uh, building a good company culture and why we think that uh, the team here at Plainsight Strategy Group can actually help you uh, if you're having a problem establishing it or understanding the importance of it. And I don't think anyone fails to understand the criticality or the importance of having a good, healthy company culture. I think that sometimes there's a lack of follow through uh, and under pressure. The first thing that seems to fall off the stack is the adherence to or the dedication to company culture. And, and I've fallen prey to that. I've fallen prey to it recently, in fact. This is not something you're just going to get right and have right in perpetuity uh, or perpetuity, as some people pronounce it. Uh, it's something that you have to constantly care and feed. So with that said, I'm going to continue with if you're watching this on uh, on YouTube, you'll see the slides. If you're on Spotify, I now have a slide on the screen that says the first piece uh, to sort of laying out company culture is defining those shared values. Right? You've got to, to do three things around those values. You've got to identify them. You've got to validate them. When I say validate, like if you found a company and you found it on your principles, then in theory, you can just establish the company culture by saying, this is my culture and my company will live the way my culture is. Now, that could work. Uh, but as you grow, you're going to bring more people into the, the puzzle and you may find that they don't all agree with you. So validating that the, the culture in the form of values still is representative of your team is important. And then the last part, which arguably is one of the most important one is to communicate it, not just internally, but externally, your team all needs to understand what the values are that you make decisions by what are the things that are going to be underpinning the decisions that you make, whether they be hiring, firing, uh, investment, uh, strategic, these values that represent the codification of your culture, the more your team sort of understands them, the less confusion there will be. And confusion is a big deal. And, and I'll probably riff on confusion later as it was a heart of the coaching that I went through with a great company called Talentism. I was fortunate enough to have Trevor Hunter on uh, and talk about uh, their intellectual property and their desire to drive companies to become clarity companies. But that confusion that can come about as a result of not clearly identifying, validating, and communicating your shared values as a company, which represent your culture, can be incredibly toxic. Uh, and and for, for the purposes of this podcast, one of the examples I'll give you is, is at my previous company, one of the things that we talked about, and I don't really know where it came from. I think it maybe got developed when we were writing a proposal, because sometimes that's how it happens. You're not as uh, planful as you'd like to be sometimes. And certainly the younger I was, the less planful I was with regards to strategy. But one of the things that we would often talk about when we were presenting to prospective clients, or we would remind our current clients, uh, is that we won't always be right, but we'll always make it right. And acknowledging that fallibility was really critical to our company. And when I look at the relationships that we had with our clients, it's one of the things I'm incredibly proud of. We had clients that stood with us all the way through the end. And, you know, we had an incredible board from our private equity firm at Shamrock Capital. And I know that I heard on more than one occasion how impressed they were that we didn't just have clients, right? It's almost like, in, and I know that people always get upset when you use the word family, but just everyone calm down. We had friends, we had relationships with our clients. Our clients were as invested in our success as we were in theirs. And I do believe a lot of that came down to the fact that they knew who we were. They knew what we stood for. They knew if a problem was brought up, and this will be another, I think, good articulation of what culture can do and what the clear understanding of culture can do. If there was a defect found or a problem found in a platform that we had delivered or a, an application that we had rolled out, a lot of times, it can be uh, spoken about how that just means change orders and cost, and there's gonna be no ownership of that issue. That was never the case with us. If, if an issue was brought up on one of our technical solutions and our leadership team or whatever team was leading that effort, and, and this is a, a sort of throwaway here, folks, that I'll, I'll toss in. Leadership is not title. 
leadership just is. You have leaders throughout your entire organization. Um, but if leadership felt that this was something we should have just known, we should have not imposed this pain. We should have caught this early, whether it's because it was a defect that we should have caught through better QA or whether it was just an obvious case that we didn't see, we would just fix it. We would just address it because that was on us. It's our bad. It's like playing a pickup game. However, if it wasn't, if it was a new scenario, if it was a perverse condition, if it was if it was legitimately something that was not our fault, not something we could have anticipated, not something we could have caught, because we were so dogmatic about owning it and jumping on the grenade when it was our issue, our clients never pushed back when it was theirs. That was the absolute embodiment of our culture, our values, our shared values, making tangible impact to the business. And if you fast forward a long way into the COVID shutdowns, those values were so clear between us and our clients that we were able to renegotiate our contracts with many of them to keep us alive when they were hurting as bad or worse than we were because they knew that we had done those sorts of good things for them over time. So uh, I, I can't say enough how important the shared values concept is. And I'm not saying you have to adopt this one, but find whatever it is. What is the thing that drives you as a leader in an organization? What is the thing that drives your leadership team? And maybe something that brings your leadership team together, that unifies your leadership team, whether you're all by the same title or spidered out throughout your organization, and then when you validate that, validate it with your entire team. Get out there, meet with them, find things. And there'll be another topic here that, that will bring this into a little bit more clarity as we go through the rest of the topics. The next piece is employment, employee engagement. And this is one that is uh, a little bit harder than I will probably make it seem to be. And I admit, again, that I was really crappy at this for a long time. And many leaders are the more... Mm, I'll say charismatic, but charismatic is is really sort of painting this with a positive brush. The more bullheaded on the other end of the spectrum, the louder uh, a leader is, the less likely you are to get engagement. And one of the most powerful lessons I've learned throughout my decades of doing many things right and many things wrong is perspectives matter. Seeing the world through someone else's lens gives you not just their perspective, but it gives you incredible feedback on yours. It lets you do some really good introspection to figure out, well, why the hell did I think this was the right way to do it when, when there's such you know clear feedback that it's not? So you've got to build an environment where your employees all feel, your teams all feel that they can be heard. Now, this again is not the place for some sort of silly program with just surveys or, you know, uh, an attempt to automate under the auspices that we're looking for engagement without authenticity. And there's some great tools out there that can make this easier and allow you data and the data is important. We, we talked about that in the past, data converted to information is super powerful. So I'm not saying that the, the tools are inherently the problem. It's the way we leverage the tools to collect the data, but more importantly, what we do with the data. If you collect the feedback and do nothing with the feedback, that's worse than asking. Right. And, and it's, it's funny. I have what's called an autonomy trigger. If you ask me to do something and then you come in and muck around with how it's being done, it pisses me off. Uh, if you, if you ask for people's feedback and then you disregard it, you're going to piss them off. You're better off not asking. And my feedback to you is you damn well better ask because you need to know. And so the sort of truism that comes as a result of that is once they tell you, you need to take it in consideration. Does that mean you have to do what they say? No, it doesn't. It means that you have to at least acknowledge that you heard it and that you've taken it into consideration and show why if you've chosen not to implement maybe a piece of feedback or a recommendation, why it was chosen and engage them in that meaningful dialogue. Uh, another piece here is about recognition. And, and I'm, I don't talk a lot about recognition, which is really a, a failure of mine, I think, because um, I'm not someone who's driven by recognition, but most people are. And in fact, there's some data I'll talk about a little bit later around why people leave. Um, but a, a little story I have is I had a, a, a good friend uh, and a tremendous technical uh, architect that I worked at in my former company named Deepak. And most, much of our company was in India. Um, this is a little side note in case you didn't realize it. If you have a multinational company, uh, and it doesn't have to be multinational, if you have 
regionally diverse uh, company, you need to pay attention to the differences that exist culturally. And I don't mean from your shared values, but from where people are from, uh, potentially what religion they're from. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Like all of those dimensions matter because you need to at least be aware of them uh, as a uh, sort of what I would call typical pig headed American at times. And I don't mean that as much of the pejorative as it sounds. Uh, I just wanted to get things right and I wanted to do things and I just moved forward and I was a bull in a China shop. Uh, and, and, and I sometimes fall into that same criteria now. I've gotten, I think, better at it. But when I was working with Deepak early, I would always be a, a little bit effusive with my praise and, and thank him for the things he was doing. And there was a little bit of a language barrier early, though Deepak's English was infinitely better than any of my uh, foreign language would be. And it took me probably six months to get close enough to Deepak for him to tell me that he never understood why I thanked him for the things he was doing because they were his job. And that sort of floored me. And, and I thought, well, God, just, it's, it's just a nice thing to say. Uh, it's, a, it's a small piece of recognition. This isn't even a big piece of recognition. We'll talk about real big recognition a little bit later when we get into recognition and rewards. But it's imperative that as you're building your culture, you understand the language that your company uses, how your company evolves to give feedback to one another and engage with one another. What drives authenticity? Because to be honest, at the beginning, he felt as though it was it was false. Those thank yous were uh, disingenuine. And that wasn't good. And until he got to know me, I ended up making my first trip over to India. And he realized that I was being sincere. All of those thank yous did nothing but make things worse. And I had no idea. It certainly wasn't an intentional thing. But we had to continue those conversations and engage and engage in all the dimensions. And, and this is a sidetrack. We'll probably do a whole podcast on. There seems to be a, a return to work push that are going on. There's a bunch of reasons for that. I've been remote for, I don't know, 20 years. I think there's incredible things you can do using this two dimensional space that we do with screens and Zoom and Teams, et cetera. Nothing replaces physical presence. It doesn't mean you have to do it all the time. It doesn't mean that I'm an art and go back to work. Uh, go back to the office person, but it does mean that as you are continuing to build out your company, develop your culture, co-location matters at times. You have to be able to connect as a human in order to start to build the, and foster those sorts of pieces of culture. And you can do that in your own way. And I'll go on a sidetrack here as well. When, when we took our private equity investment, one of the pieces of feedback we heard was we needed to get everyone into one office. And, you know, fortunately, we had a, a private equity partner who actually listened to our feedback and we said, no, that's that's not culturally who we are. We're we are a distributed workforce. We want people to live where they want to live. We trust them to do the jobs they need to do. And then instead of having to take on those fixed costs of uh, one location and, and relocation and all that sort of stuff, we'll do things that are morale focused. And to be honest, we probably drop the ball on doing enough of those collective events where we bring people together. But. Finding a way to create that human connection and get that engagement, whatever it is, whether it's email, asynchronous or synchronous communication, open town hall meetings, find the one that fits for the people in your organization and and really encourage that engagement. Now, this one's going to ruffle some feathers because it is called creating an inclusive environment. And for various reasons in our current political climate, uh, diversity, equity and inclusion has become the demon for some group of the as my friend Bart would say, the Yankees, the Red Sox, which team you're on, that's not what this topic is about. If you guys wanna go out and have uh, Jameson and talk about that topic, I'm happy to do it. I doubt that I'll ever talk about it uh, on this podcast, but where I'm talking about inclusion and I'm talking about diversity is really the message behind the phrase that has been sort of demonized. I honestly believe that we're better when we have diversity, when we have differing opinions, I learned so much from people that came from a different place than I did, whether it's geographically, economically, uh, culturally, whatever it is. And the more open I have become to learning how those people from a different place, and I'll just use place as the placeholder here, how those folks process all of the stimulus that we face on a day-to-day -day basis, the better I've become at understanding why I perceive things the way I do and what we always tried to do in my last few companies was we tried to be the best of all of them, right? We tried to respect the, 
the differences, right? It doesn't mean become just one homogenized soup. And when I uh, when I do have Jameson, one of the things I talk about is the the phrase e pluribus unum, which it vaguely or, or roughly translates into out of many one. It doesn't mean that we're not many. It means that we come together as a company, right? Or in this case, I'm using it. We come together as a company with shared values, but we respect the differences in the places where all of our individual values come from, and we learn from them. Uh, I do have in the in the uh, image in the YouTube video here that you can't see on Spotify. Uh, I was doing some prep for this show, and I talked about why why inclusion would be bad. And Copilot, our friendly Chat GPT equivalent overlords from the Microsoft team, respectfully said that he he or she I don't know what uh, Copilot identifies as didn't want to have that conversation. So sidebar, even our AI overlords uh, avoid this topic. What I'm telling you is as a leader, inclusion is not a bad word and neither is diversity. Understand it, respect it, and leverage it as the incredible turbocharge that it can be to gain perspective and additional lenses on all of the things you do as a, a, a company. The next topic is continuous learning. Uh, this is one that I think would be in most business books and have far less uh, flowery uh, discussion around it than most of my other topics. But by encouraging a culture of continuous learning and development, you are making the people who make your company great better. You're also showing that you give a damn, that you care. The companies I've worked at that have done employee reimbursement for education, who have had programs to help employees enrich themselves in different ways. In fact, and I know I talk about 37 signals all a, lot, a great deal, um, but I think they even had a package where like you could go to uh, learn how to make sushi. Like you could choose the things you wanted to do to enrich your life. And with a more enriched life, you were a more total person at work. You've got to prioritize employee development programs. And I know that those become a very common thing for people to cut quickly or to not employ because it goes to the cost side of the equation. But make no mistake, in practically every business, your most important resource are your people. Now, my sidebar here is, I, and I've, I've mentioned this in writing, I, at Microsoft, we did a, a really neat uh, management training class. It was an offsite out in the woods. You had no cellular contact. And one of the things we did was a Tango business simulation, which is now owned by a company called Celemi, C-E-L-E-M-I, I believe. And you broke into teams and you were supposed to simulate multiple years of running a company and you had projects and you had resources. Um, and you would start at the beginning and say, we wanna be a boutique consulting company or we wanna be a head shop or we wanna be whatever. And then you'd manage your resources over the fiscal years that were simulated. And then at the end of the day, you'd find out what you were. And the, the three things that you could use to retain, attract, retain, and reward talent were compensation, development opportunities, and recognition and engagement. Those are the three things. And, and the game took that in consideration. And, and you can look at it with regards to how you handle any of your employees now. You can certainly pay people more. And, and compensation matters. It's, it's not a hobby for most folks, right? But rarely will you engender loyalty, uh, and commitment by just throwing money at someone. Now, you need to share the wealth. You need to build a system whereby people feel as though their, their, their contribution is being justly and fairly rewarded. And they have an opportunity to, to better themselves and their families or the ones that they love. But when you start peeling back this onion, the development opportunities, the ability for learning and, and betterment and recognition and engagement, the, the other piece is, complex challenges, and that goes into the development opportunities. It, it used to be more obvious in the game. Challenging projects, new languages, uh, travel, these are things you can do to give people the opportunity to learn and experience new things uh, as a member of your team. Next up, we have recognition and rewards. Um, it's it's very interesting, and I'm going to go back in a second and and hit something that I missed. I just took a look at my notes down here, and I realized I had a note um, that I didn't cover. Actually, let me do that before I do that. Let me go back before I do that. When we're talking about employee engagement, you have to make sure that you're aware of cultural differences around communication, and direct communication may not be something that works for everybody. 
So you've got to find the right tool for the right job. Find, you gotta meet people where they are and you have to use the trust that you're building with them to get honest feedback. You don't want people just saying what you what they think you want them to say. And in fact, when I was listening to some of Infinite Game, there was a discussion about uh, Malali going into Ford and asking for sort of a red, yellow, green status from all the directors. And, and they were losing money, they were hemorrhaging cash, and they kept saying, everything's green, everything's green, everything's green. Because culturally, if you said everything, something was bad, you got yelled at and fired. Now, when I heard that story, I thought to myself that this has to be a spoof. There can't possibly have been a CEO of a company the size of Ford who would take honest feedback about things that aren't going well as something to raise hell about and fire people for rather than something that needs to be addressed. But apparently this stuff is true. So anyway, apologies for the diatribe or the sidetrack. Recognition rewards, boosting morale with recognition rewards is something that I used to suck at. I used to use the phrase, I don't thank the light for turning on. And that was just such an old school Microsoft concept. Like the basic blocking and tackling, if you were a program manager, you're expected to do program manager stuff. If you were a developer, you're expected to do developer stuff. Well, there's a pure logical part of me that thinks that that is, that is still fine. It doesn't work with humans. It just doesn't. We have to thank each other. We have to be engaged. We have to find ways that are authentic to ourselves, right? It can't be feigned. And, and <laughs> what the hell was it? Uh, movie with Will Smith. Oh, I won't remember the name of it. And I, I don't want to go back and edit this. It was a superhero movie and he was a drunk superhero. And when he came back, uh, Jason Bateman re, uh, got him back and got him a uniform. And he went to help cops. And he told him to go thank you and say, good job. And so he walked up to the cops and said, good job, good job. And it was super feigned, but he was trying. You have to find a way that is authentic to you to recognize and reward people for the things that they're doing, to say thank you. And in fact, just before I started recording this podcast, there was an article on LinkedIn uh, from a private equity uh, staffing group talking about CEOs getting burnt out because they were tired of getting you know shit on by the board and never thanked for the effort. Now, I know it's going to be met with a chorus of woe is the life of the CEO, because that's a very common thing for people to, to complain about now. But the reality is everybody wants to be thanked for the hard work that they're doing and the effort that they're putting in. Now, as I got older and more experienced, uh, one of the things that we implemented at a previous company was this program called an ambassador program. And when I say we implemented it is a, a bunch of us had some ideas and we brainstormed on it. We came up with a structure and then we brought other people in who had very different perspectives and were in very different parts of the organization, both level and experience. And we let them create a program that would onboard folks that were new and showed tremendous uh, aptitude, capability, and would run them through a program, give them, ex expose them to more opportunities for education and really started to build something special. Now, I, I'm really sad for a bunch of reasons about our last company going the way of the dinosaur. But I'm also sad that because of the stresses that we faced due to the pandemic and, and economic strife and, and eventually the litigation that led to our demise, uh, the ambassador program never got to grow into what it was. And we had some incredible people who were running it, who were passionate and dedicated. And the folks who were running through that program just did such incredible things. And it cost us almost nothing to do. When you look at the budgets, folks, building a program like this that recognizes people's efforts rewards them for the things they're doing, makes them feel special, and creates little seeds throughout your organization of cultural enhancement are just immeasurable in response. So rather than my uh, ridiculously pig-headed, I don't thank the light for turning on, being more aware of what it means to thank people for the things they do or, or build programs that allow you to thank them more formally. Uh, this will become clear why it's so important in a second as we uh, as we continue the rest of this and, and I close out this session around culture. Uh, I wanna reiterate that company culture, it's more than a buzzword. It is literally the heart and soul of the company and, and the closer you can make that be to your aggregate heart and soul, the better it's going to be because it will feel more authentic. That authenticity will just be derived from the fact that it comes from taking into consideration the lens of your diverse organization. And if you do that, 
you will not just help build the trust, but you will cement trust throughout your entire organization. People will know, they'll be able to predict how a company will respond to things, whether it's economic uh, strife, lost clients, uh, defects in the product that you may be producing, uh, unexpected turns of the market. The more your team can properly mentally model how the organization will respond, to these sort of conditions, the less confusion you will have in your organization and the healthier you will be. Now to build culture, make no mistake, companies have to invest in it. And that doesn't mean investing in, you know, sort of silly throwaway morale programs. These are all just tools. They're arrows in your quiver, but they have to be done with a holistic plan to find your real heart and soul validate it and communicate it to the team and make sure everyone's on board with it. Uh, before this podcast, I went out and checked and since 2010, and I just went back to 2010 because that's far enough back for it to matter. You know, 14 years is a pretty good run. When you think about reasons people leave an organization and whether you're talking about quiet quitting, loud quitting, uh, the vacationing thing that people are doing now, compensation hasn't cracked number four. It just hasn't. It's not money that keeps people places. And this, this sort of goes back to the tango simulation. What keeps people is feeling like they're part of something more than a job, right? That's, that's really what brings people to these organizations and what keeps them there. The thing that drives them away is bad leadership. Lack of uh, that sort of investment in them. It's not all about compensation. Like I said, that's just sort of table stakes. You need to pay people well. You need to compensate them for the work that they do. You need to be fair. You need to constantly be reevaluating that. But the biggest thing that goes into culture are these, these pieces and parts around driving authenticity and showing this through recognition and rewards to your, to your team, communicating openly and honestly and making sure that they understand what your company does. And, you know, Cynic talks about this a lot with regards to how values uh, can drive a company. And I won't get into that. And, and I'm new to Simon Cynic, so this isn't derived simply from him. But when you look at how a company can be built to sustain, um, you have to get beyond tactical and get into strategic. You have to get beyond short term and get into longer term. And I know that you may be sitting there going, well, God, this guy, uh, you know, heads up a company that, that really targets uh, portfolio companies for private equity. There are investment theses. There's usually a three to five year plan. Let's get this in, get the revenues up, and get, you know, increase EBITDA and, and get our exit. These are awfully soft skills uh, for, for a team like that. And, and I would counter that that's not true. They may sound soft uh, because they don't show up well in an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, but building culture is absolutely not optional for long-term success. With that, I'm going to tease next week's uh, or next the next episode. We're doing these every two weeks, and we're going to do a little call to action. The next topic that we're going to be tackling in this series is uh, innovation in traditional industries. And I'm using innovation sort of as a placeholder for tech, for technology, because I'm a tech guy. I, I leverage tech. I love technology. I love development. I love software. Uh, this is These are suites of tools that can make things better. And I want to address how those suites of tools can be leveraged. I want to talk about some cautionary tales about when they've been leveraged wrong. I want to absolutely hammer this concept that uh, quite often it's not the tool. It's the tool using the tool. And that will make more sense uh, after the next podcast and blog. But that's what we're going to talk about next week. So uh, I want to thank you guys for listening to this episode. Hopefully this format is something you're enjoying. Uh, if you are enjoying it, I encourage you to share it with your, your colleagues and friends. We'd love to get feedback. Uh, right now, like I said, we're using LinkedIn as our primary uh, social media platform. Uh, we post this on the Plainsight Strategy Group LinkedIn page, which I encourage you to go out there and follow and engage with us on. Uh, all of our individual members of the team, the partners in the firm, uh, try to reshare this through their personal networks as well. But to be honest, social media is just not something that we spend a lot of time on. We spend a lot more time with actual humans. Um, <laughs> and I think that that, uh, 
that sort of scalable humanity aspect is something that we're going to talk about. But it does give us reach and it does help us a great deal. So if you want to know a way you can help us, share this and in interact with us. Reach out with questions you may have or topics you'd like us to cover. And if there's any way that we can help you at Plain Sight, please do reach out. We're at www.plain-sight.net. And all of that stuff will be in the closeout for this podcast. So thanks again for listening to Plain Spoken. And we will see you in two weeks on Plain Spoken and multiple times between then on our blog. Thanks so much for tuning into another episode of Plain Spoken. I hope today's conversation sparked some new ideas and left you with a few takeaways to ponder or implement in your own journey. If you enjoyed the show, found value in our dialogue, I'd be really grateful if you could hit the subscribe button. Sharing this podcast with your network helps us grow and continue to bring you insightful and engaging content. Don't forget, you can find us on LinkedIn and a few other social platforms. Follow us, interact with our posts, and join the Plain Spoken community. Your thoughts, feedback, and ideas are what keep this conversation going. So please drop us a line or leave us a comment. Thanks again for joining me, Derek Fournier, on Plain Spoken. Keep an eye out for our next episode. And until then, keep growing. What the, 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 what